but we just want to hit record so that way everybody doesn't miss a moment. So welcome back if you were here yesterday. If you're brand new here, um, we're going to go over everything that we're going to talk about so that you're fully prepared to participate in our second ever virtual field day. So this is day two. I had to pull up my thing. The return of the bison to Miniopa State Park, how fire grazing and persistence play a role in prairie recovery. And we're just gonna get started with everybody introducing themselves and we'll start with the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative folks. Um, and then we'll go to our panel participants. And this time I am gonna introduce myself. This is what we do, this continuous improvement from yesterday. So I'm Megan Benage. I'm a regional ecologist with Minnesota DNR based out of New Ulm and I cover 32 counties in Southern Minnesota. And then we'll just go right down the line alphabetically. Hi, I am Jessica Dowler. I am a biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I cover the Western South Dakota complex, which is Sand Lake, Huron, and Lake Andes Wetland Management Districts. I'm stationed at Sand Lake National Wildlife Refuge. Um, I've been with the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative since the beginning um, for about 10, 11 years now, and uh, I've just recently joined the Field Days group, so I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this experience. Morning, everybody. I'm Becky Esser. I'm a biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well. I'm stationed in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, and cover the Detroit Lakes Wetland Management District, which is five counties. Um, been with PRI for 10 plus years, and same with the Field Days team. Excited for day two. Morning, I'm uh, Tom Skelling. I am also a biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm uh, stationed at Union Slough National Wildlife Refuge and also the Iowa Wetland Management District, which covers north central Iowa, 35 counties in Iowa. Uh, and I've been part of the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative since it started. All right, we're going to move to the our awesome panelists. Craig, we're going to start with you. Uh, Craig Beckman, currently the manager at Flandre State Park, but previously manager at Blue Mountain State Park and Miniopa State Park. Both both had bison for Minnesota State Parks and Trails. Scott Kadelka, it's all you. Good morning. I'm Scott Kadelka, former uh, Miniopa area naturalist and retired. Ashley Stevens. I'm the current park manager here at Miniopa State Park. Molly Trannell Nelson. I am the regional resource specialist based out of New Ulm for the Southern Region Parks and Trails. And Gwen, you are last but certainly not least. <laughs> I'm Gwen Westerman. I manage 2.75 acres along the Maple River south of Good Thunder. <laughs> When those 2.7 acres are making a difference, don't you forget it. <laughs> I know, I don't know why today we decided to talk about how large our areas are, <laughs> but we did. So, so there it is. Oh, this training today is a partnership with the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And we want all of you to be part of the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative. And so Becky Esser is going to very briefly just share with everybody what the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative is. And you can tell when I'm doing things in the background because I start talking slower. <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out how to do all of this at once. All right. Okay, one um, PRI, or the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative, is a community of prairie practitioners and researchers, and we're from more than 30 organizations that work together to improve prairie reconstructions so that they're bi biologically diverse, ecologically functional, and resist invasion by non-native plants. We focus our activities within two general areas, evidence-based tools and peer-to-peer -peer learning. Our tools include a vegetation monitoring protocol and a prairie reconstruction database for collecting a standard suite of data about our reconstructions. And by pooling and analyzing data for many reconstructions, we hope to reveal those pivotal elements that increase the likelihood that all of those reconstructions meet our expectations. 
Our learning opportunities include both in-person and online events, such as this virtual field day, where the PRI community can exchange experiences and knowledge with each other. We believe these insights from both individual experiences and scientific investigation lead to our collective success. Great job, Becky. Great job trying to click the button that says end slideshow. Nothing happens. It's great. <laughs> We're going to have a good, good field day today. I already know. Okay, just a couple. So the way that this is going to work is we are going to show two modules today. We showed two modules yesterday. So if you missed yesterday, no one panic. Those are going to be on the Prairie Construction Initiative website. And one of our PRI team in the background is going to pop that website location into the chat, into the Teams chat, so that way you have it. Um, and so we'll show a video and then we'll discuss and ask questions about that video. We're going to do that using a platform called Padlet or using just the Teams meeting chat. Yesterday, some folks had trouble with the Teams chat and some folks had trouble with Padlet. So we'll use both and we will make sure to capture your question if you ask it in the chat in this Padlet, just so that way um, afterwards you can see kind of all of the questions that were, were asked and answered. It's a nice way to do that. For those who may not be familiar with Teams, it's got a lot of fun features here. The chat is right here, this little bubble. So you click on it and then it pops up um, both the Padlet that we're going to use for asking, uh, oh, whoops, this is the Padlet for what we're excited to learn about today, and then the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative site. If you want to see who else is here, you can click the People tab and scroll down and see all of the folks who are participants. And just like yesterday, because 8.30 is early to start a, to start a virtual training, we're going to have people trickling in all throughout. So you can see who's here, say hi. We encourage that. If something's not working for you or you need help, uh, just raise your hand or type in the chat and one of the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative team will try to help you in the background. If we're saying something that, you know, it's just amazing, you can use these little React icons. It'll light up your little circle that's around your name and it's a, a nice way to show that you're still here and you're still engaged. What I should have started with, and I did this yesterday too, if you go to more, the three little dots that say more, you can turn on live captions. So if captions is something that you need, this is a great way to access that. It turns on captions just for you, so nobody will know that you've got captions turned on. The videos today are all open captioned, so um, they'll, the captions are embedded in the video, so they'll just automatically play with it. And then this is your camera, your mic, and then for most folks who are attendees, you don't have the sharing icon. All right. That is how this is going to work. A couple tips and tricks on connectivity. So I have done everything I can on my end to make this a seamless and smooth experience for you. Some things you can do on your end. You can open your network settings and look at all of the processes that are running in the background and you can pause or stop those practices. You can clear any browser caches that you've used anytime recently. You can close all applications in the background. Um, keep your video off because unless you're asking a question because we do like to see your face. Otherwise, that's um, a really good way. And then one of the last things you can do is you can turn Wi-Fi off on all devices that you're not using. You can also restart your router, which is another way to kind of clear the cache of most things. But of course, then you won't be connected right now if that's something that you did right in this moment. So that would be sad. Most importantly, your cell phone's probably sitting next to you. You can just toggle the Wi-Fi off on your cell phone, and that also can help boost your connectivity. So I think we are ready to go. Craig, I'm just going to turn your... Oh, Craig Beckman, can you turn your camera off? That would be wonderful. Thanks. Not that we don't, you know, enjoy watching you work, but... Okay, I, Becky, Tom, Jess, did I miss anything? I don't think so. I don't think so. I the thing I miss the most is make sure you have your snacks handy. We're about to watch a movie. Okay, we're, we're gonna start with module three. 
Uh, and it's managing prairie and savanna with grazing and fire. So Becky is just going to make sure to tell me that the sound is working well on this. When I open this video. One sec. Okay. All right, here we go. Becky, just let me know. Actually, I already know you don't have sound because I didn't toggle it. Let me know if you have sound now. The bison reintroduction yes. changed the management stakes at Miniopa. Um, I think it was a, I think it became a real opp opportunity at Miniopa. It's a, it was a, a prairie area that had been kind of overrun with woody vegetation, some non-native species, and um, it really gave us an opportunity to delve into the realm of using human management techniques, both fire, uh, biological, um, using herbicides, along with a large mammal that was on this landscape in the past. Really, the logistics is, is I think it, it, it wasn't as big of a deal as you might think it is, but it, it goes down to this great relationship that we have with the Minnesota Zoo. Um, and so I think that partnership has been very beneficial for both of us. And so really getting these animals moved around would be tough on our end, but with that relationship with the Minnesota Zoo and then also uh, the Minwakan tribe in Shakopee for providing that funding for us to really buy those trailers. Um, it's really comes down to partnerships and by having these great strong partnerships, it doesn't make it as challenging as maybe that you would think that they were. So we brought in the three from the Minnesota Zoo. We brought in the eight from uh, Blue Mounds. We actually had them separated. They could see each other in these smaller corral areas. And then it was funny because they were kind of moving around the fence, like checking each other out. And from what I hear, bison like to see other bison. So that was good. And then we brought them in together and there was one from each place that did a little bit of headbutting and probably to decide who was the leader. We opened the gate and they ran down the road, 25 miles an hour, running down the road. At the time, Gary Teipel was our park manager. Him and Diane from the zoo were behind him. And Gary goes, did I shut the gate? Was the gate shut? Because we didn't know when they got to that category because none of them had seen that. Would, what would they do? They got to the cattle guard, they looked at it, and then they started walking around the border of their new home. The bison themselves are not that complex. They're fairly easy to manage. Um, it's the people that come along with the bison. So I'd say it's the park visitors that are the hardest part to manage. And just having to explain and justify more each management decision we make and being very deliberate about it. Um, whereas before, with not as many eyes on it, I would have maybe just made that decision myself and done it. Um, now there's more of a process, um, especially anything that the public could view as um, controversial. You know, we manage them as wild animals as wild as they can be within 330 acres so sometimes they're going to want to see us treat them more like pets or um, you know really hands-on management but we still are trying to let them be as wild as they can um, if there's a bison limping for example it's going to be more um, stressful for that animal for us to try to catch them and vet them than if we just let it go and it will nine times out of 10, just be fine in a week or two. Um, but the public doesn't always understand that. So sometimes we have to really um, explain why we do what we do. Number one is I would visit as many places that have bison and talk to the staff. That would be number one. 
find out what are you really getting yourself into. And then think about where you're putting them. Is it a place that bison are going to not only be able to stay, but thrive? And think about the interaction, because no matter what, even if you don't have a road through it, you're gonna have interaction from the public. So think about how that interaction is going to play out. And of course, you know, we drilled the well, so they have water, but even then you want a second watering source. And right now we our second water source is dry. So I think there's a lot of moving parts that you really need to think about. Don't expect that you're gonna say, I'm gonna bring in bison. And then the next year you're gonna bring in bison. It's probably gonna be a process of four or five years. So the bison are here all year, and um, we we handle them once a year for vaccinations and health checks, and then to get rid of some of the newly born animals um, to prevent inbreeding. And so they graze out here all winter. Um, they are fed a supplemental hay, and that's um, some hay that we get from another part of the park down. Um, it's kind of just an old field that we hay for that purpose. So it's not very high in nutrition. It's mostly to keep them just happy during the winter. Um, Cause again, happy bisons don't test fence. They create kind of these grazing lawns that are their favorite spots. Um, they, the thing that struck me is they move around so much when they're grazing. Like if you watch cattle, they fairly, you know, stay in the same spot for a while and then they might move bison seem like they're always on the move like they're moving and they can be from one end to the range to the other and you you're just like whoa where'd they come from or where'd they go they're just they move around a lot more they go further from water um as for preferences they love prairie drop seed like that's like candy to them um but they don't really go for the little blue stem out there so um they do like the cool season exotics. Um, they like sedges, um, you know, just any of the grasses really they'll hit depending on the time of year when it's young and succulent. So I think of um, grazing with bison as any conservation tool like fire or um, woody removal. Some things are going to benefit and some things aren't. Um, so we weren't quite sure what to expect um you know and I, I knew from the literature bison eat 90 percent grass and they don't eat forbs and they're not browsers but um that's pretty much what we're seeing the areas that were weedy before bison because this does have a grazing history were, are still weedy and some of them are a little bit weedier with the um, annual weeds especially around some of the wallows and wallows are being created but that's all so increasing the diversity out there. Um, we're seeing, you know, like for example, I saw a wallow that was covered in annual weeds that was blooming and it was covered in bees. So that's creating a new little patch for them. Um, we are seeing a lot more low growing forbs um, and that goes along with they're eating all the grass and they're allowing those forbs to uh, release a little bit. So. Um, we are seeing that they have their favorite areas, so we are trying to move them around more using both the patch burn grazing and using um, exclosures. So kind of the opposite of rotational grazing where you would move the animal. What we're doing is moving the exclosure because it's hard to move a bison herd. So um, we're just doing little um, electric wire um, exclosures, especially they love sedges. So in our sedge meadows, wanted to give those a little bit of a rest. Um, so just fence those off. And the bison do respect the electric fence, even the single strand electric. Um, they're able to keep them out until we let those sedges kind of have a rest and then we'll move the exclosure. Because there wasn't fire for a long time and um, before I started, about 10 years ago, the manager, a new manager came in and was like, I'm going to burn more. And so he started doing that. And then I got here and I was like, yeah, let's get burning. So we opened up some units that hadn't been burned in forever. Within the bison range, we have about eight burn units, uh, 10, because 
yeah, 10 burn, burn units. Um, and sometimes we'll burn multiple units at a time. We kind of started on a three year interval, which was pretty aggressive for us. Um, and now with the bison out here um, and how they're grazing, and then we've actually had a drought last year and we're in a drier period this year, we decided to give it a rest this year. We burned other parts of the park, but not the range. And, um, and now we're gonna back off and probably more of a five year interval. And we are going to do um, about 10% of the bison range at a time. And um, our grazing specialist tells me that is what you should do for patch burn grazing. So we're, we were doing more about 30% just because we were trying to catch up. And we were seeing that those patches were too big for our bison herd because we had, when we started, we only had a few animals. And so it was really too big. Now we're in between 30 and 40, depending on the time of year. So with 10%, they should be able to move to that patch, stay on it. They like the green shoots that come up after you burn. And then that way um, it doesn't get high too quickly. So if the patch is too big, they can't keep it short and then they'll just move to wherever. So, so we're going for 10% now. Bison honestly do not care that we're burning out here. Um, some of our cows came from Blue Mounds where we burn every year, almost every year out there. And so they were used to it. The only ones who really get excited are maybe the new calves or kind of like, you know, what is this smoke? But um, they usually go to a high spot and watch us. And we really haven't had any problems. So we do um, monitoring. We're using the grassland monitoring team protocol, um, what I like to call the Cadillac version. Um, where we have a botanist come out and um, she does transects, um, visual obstruction readings to look at structure. Uh, we look at what percentage is invasives, what percentage are woodies, and then also um, looking at all the species that are found out here. So um, that's what we do for plants. Um, right now, we're just doing some pretty basic surveys for uh, birds. I'd like to do more for pollinators as well, but we're not quite there yet. Um, but that's how we're checking and we do that every three years and we have uh, one year of data before the bison came out, uh, which is really important um, to kind of see what we started with. Um, and then we're going to do it again this year. And by the end of this year, we should have enough data in the data set to really do a, a big analysis. It can make it a little more challenging in that um, if the bison are working in the area you plan to work that day, you don't get to work there. <laughs> or if the bison are standing in the middle of the road and you were going to go do a prescribed burn and they won't let your truck through, you wait 20 minutes to till they move out of the road. But otherwise, um, it's not too bad. It's not too hard to work out here. We have safety protocols. Um, most of us have been around them long enough to know um, not to get too close. Um, they're very curious with new equipment. Um, so like we were gonna do um, some flail vacking of the little blue stem out here and they all came running because they'd never heard a flail vac before. And my job was to walk in front of the tractor so that they didn't hit any rocks and I just bailed for the truck. I was like, I'm out. Like, <laughs> So, you know, it does, pose a challenge sometimes, but I mean, I still come out here seed collect, we do uh, prescribed burns, we do um, forestry mowing of the sumac. So it, you know, we've still been able to do all our regular management. The setting that Miniopa has, um, the public nature of it does does affect our management techniques um, because we need to we need to do we're responsible for two things, which is managing the native landscape. But we're also responsible for giving the visitors an opportunity to see the bison. So it does it does affect where we choose to do our management. Um, because people come here and frankly, they're disappointed if they leave and they don't see the bison. So we absolutely do choose management techniques that are maybe in close proximity to the trails, proximity to the roadway, where we can reduce woody vegetation there that is accomplishing our goal, but it's also providing our visitors the best experience that they can have too.
All right. That is the video. And then we're just going to spend the rest of this time answering all of your questions. And so again, like we talked about, you can do that using the Teams chat or Becky helpfully put in um, a link to the Padlet. And so I forgot earlier to make sure that everybody knows how to use the Padlet. <laughs> that seems critical, right? So the way that you use it, you click on that link um, and it should take you to this website and you just use this plus in the bottom right and you can type in a post. And it's helpful to us if you're writing the Padlet, if you just do a dash dash with your name like Amanda did here, um, or you put your name in the subject, but sometimes that's intimidating because it's all in bold. Um, so just it helps us kind of keep the flow going. And some of you already did this. You were like amazing. You knew this from from yesterday what to do. And then panelists, I'm just going to have you turn your video on so that everybody can see your wonderful faces so that they know who they're talking to. And I will try to do my best to make sure that I direct some of the questions your way just so that we keep the flow going and sometimes it's nice too because then we can sort of rotate amongst you and make sure we're getting everybody's perspective not everybody but everybody out of y'all you know what i mean <laughs> so we're just going to start right away and abby asked me to read this question so i'm going to do that domestic grazers if you know of domestic grazers that most closely model the way that bison graze, would you please share what you know about them? I work in private land management and long-term maintenance tools for private lands are hard to come by in our area. And I think um, let's start with Molly for that one and then we'll rotate through because I know that Craig and Ashley did a lot of the logistics work for getting bison at the site. Um, and yeah, we'll do we'll do it like that. That sounds good. OK, um, OK, so background for me, I grew up on a Black Angus beef farm, so I know a little bit about uh, cattle grazing as well. And so I'd say you can um, you can get some really good results, like if bison are not in the cards for you and are too much to handle, you can still get some really good results with cattle grazing and mimic some of those same processes especially if you're doing um, more of a conservation grazing and going to be hands on and rotate them. And really, I think the most important thing on using grazing for a management tool is like know what your goals are. And then if you don't know what you're doing, work with a grazing specialist, they can help you. Um, there's some really knowledgeable people in Minnesota that can kind of help you kind of tailor your grazing plan so that you can meet those goals because it's not just like oh I put cattle out there and it didn't work like you've got to be very specific on time of year how many you're doing are you going to do a mob grazing are you going to move them every day so you can't do that with bison um, as easily you, some people do do it there are people who move bison every day um, some private grazers but so I would just say really know what you want to get it out of it. And then it's maybe less important on what that animal is and more important on how you're moving them and how you're uh, managing it. So hopefully that answered your question in a roundabout way. And Molly, just to ask a quick follow up. So bison are different than cattle, right? Like they yes. do graze differently. Could you maybe they do cover graze some differently? Of yeah. So, I mean, if you put cattle out on the same area and bison, they would be grazing totally different. Um, I kind of mentioned in the video, they move a lot more. Um, you know, if you have a really large range with only one water source, uh, cattle would be less likely to graze really far from the water source, whereas bison, they seem to not care as much. Um, you know, they're, they don't waste as much, I'd say, as cattle. Uh, cattle trample a lot and um, you know, don't eat some of the grass and stuff. And so I'd say bison really know how to use, they know how to convert kind of crappy forage into energy for them, whereas cattle are maybe a little pickier uh, and need, you know, better nutritional value in their forage. So, um, and they're just, you know, I mean, they're just so designed for this landscape. So they're, 
vetting and management wise, they're just so much more hardy. If you have a winter storm or something, you don't have to worry about them being out there during it like you would with cattle. So. Gregor, Ashley, do you have anything you want to add to that? And maybe in that order, Craig, and then or Ashley. <laughs> Uh-oh, Craig, we cannot hear you. No, not too much to add to that. Um, I I can't share any trade secrets from Miniopa, but you definitely can get bison trained to move when and where you want them to. Um, that said, if a bison doesn't want to move when and where you want them to, they're not going to move those locations. Um, so they can definitely be more stubborn than cattle. But um, if if they want to if you want to use them for rotational grazing and paddocks, I it's definitely definitely doable. Once you've made that connection with the lead of that herd, um, then then it can be done. Ashley, do you have any tips or tricks? I don't well, have I mean, anything I know you else have to tips add. And tricks, but. <laughs> <laughs> Gwen, how about you? Anything you want to add about maybe how bison are different than than cattle or just in general about bison? Nope. Okay. Giving everybody the opportunity except for Scott Kadelka. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Scott Kadelka, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, no, I don't. Thanks. I really shouldn't give you a hard time when you're doing me a favor by being here. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> I expect, like maybe. It. I expect it, Megan. Okay. <laughs> it's like, it seems like a dubious strategy. And then these two questions are from yesterday. And um, I don't think John and Melissa could make it today. If I'm wrong about that, just unmute yourself and say, I'm here. Um, but I'm pretty sure that they're not here today. But I think um, this is a perfect one to ask. So, and, and Gwen, get ready. I'm going to start with you. <laughs> so what are some of the hurdles slash social struggles encountered when planning for and using bison for prairie management? Really, you're going to ask me this first? <laughs> yep, I sure am. <laughs> well, from your perspective, and it could also be like for some of the partnerships, you know, where were there struggles in those partnerships or... Um, things we can learn from. No surprise, probably the most important thing is good communication among um, all of the, the partners and um, allowing some time for conversation. Um, it's um, Sometimes we assume that people know as much about bison as we do. Megan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that isn't always the case. So um, you, I always try to be um, as open as, as I can and share information about, from a, from a cultural perspective, um, why uh, opinions are important from all of the partners. And um, there's an education element to it as well, because not everybody um, understands the relationship between um, particularly the Dakota communities and bison. Uh, I'm sure everybody's seen Dances with Wolves. I can rag on it because my uncle was in it. But, um, you know, that's, that's what people think of, what they saw in the movies, what they see on TV, uh, when it comes to how we interact with, with um, uh, our bison relatives. Lots of communication. Well, I think that was perfect. I put you on the spot and you just nailed it, as you always do. It's funny that, um, funny, ironic that you mentioned Dances with Wolves because I was just listening to the Native Lights podcast this morning and they mentioned that same analogy that they were like, this is what people think of. And it's not, it's not, it's not reality. So it's good to make sure we're learning and scrubbing our brains of things that maybe popular media taught us that isn't exactly correct. 
Right. So if you've seen Dances with Wolves, you know who the chief of the band is, Ten Bears. That's my mm-hmm. uncle, Floyd Westerman. <laughs> there it is. Love it, love it. Um, okay, let's go to Scott Kadelka. From your perspective, what were some of the the hurdles and social struggles? And maybe you could talk about this from like a park visitor standpoint. Well, I think the struggle is even today is, um, and Gwen talked about it, is people's perception and not reality. Um, one of the things that people keep coming back and talking to us about is our fall management day or uh, better referred to as a roundup and everybody points to Custer State Park and say well why can't you do what they do at Custer and we're like you know I think the thing that we learn right away is the stress that this is all about the bison and visitors are really secondary and so the health and welfare of the bison has always been the number one priority. And I think if you go within that direction, that will save you a lot of stress and angst because people think, well, you could, you know, raise money, you could have this, uh, you know, huge crowds out there. And what we keep saying is, you know, the more we stress out the bison, the worse things are going to be. And so us not, uh, communicating about the fall management day when it's happening and doing it under the radar is not to uh, not allow the public to know what's happening, but is to really show that the bison are our number one priority. And they always should be the number one priority. And I always said, you know, if somebody gets injured or, you know, God forbid somebody died, well, we just shut the gate. We're not gonna move the bison. The bison are gonna be here forever but they are, will always be the number one priority. And I think that if you go into that way, I think it'll make it a lot better for you as you move forward with that. Ashley, uh, from park manager perspective, what are your thoughts here? I think one of the biggest, I guess, hurdles that we face is balancing the public perception and how they feel the animals should be cared for with with the reality of of managing them as as wild of a herd as we can. Um, One of the things we often hear in the spring is, you know, that they look malnourished, that they're really skinny. But again, bison naturally lose weight over the winter months. They're not cattle. We're not trying to keep them fattened up. We want to mimic that natural life cycle for them. Um, oftentimes, you know, they will get mounting scars during the breeding season and people get really concerned about those open wounds. And we do communicate with the vet because we are a USDA certified facility. So we do have to communicate when there are injuries. But the direction from the vet is if it's typical and it's normal and that we need to just let those heal unless we are seeing other signs of infection or things becoming worse. So um they definitely have a bond with them as visitors. And we have a lot of people that are visiting them very regularly and and know the herd probably about as well as we do. So (laughs) they get concerned and want to see them cared for just like they would care for their pets at home. Craig, do you have anything you want to add? Um, Just to be kind of, echoes what Ashley said, but just to be aware of the location that you're you're bringing bison back to. Uh, Blue Mountains are in Laverne, Minnesota, more rural, um, more landscape or uh, more livestock on the landscape down there. There wasn't the connection with the visiting public to those bison that there was at Miniopa. Ashley is correct that I think there's visitors to Miniopa that know those bison and have probably every one of the the members of that herd have names for them and know them way better than what we do. And then you look at, say, Dakota County with their new herd and that much closer to a population center. And I bet they will have that many more people that know that herd intimately, even more than Miniopa and far more than Blue Mountain. So I think where you have that herd at is gonna dictate um, some of your management styles and techniques and what you have to be aware of. 
Good. We're going to pivot to grazing methods. And Molly, we're going to start with you. And this was another question from yesterday. So I'll go ahead and ask this one. I'm just giving the participants a break, but don't you think I'm not going to ask you to give voice to your questions when we get over here? <laughs> I'm giving you a, a, a little break right now. So grazing methods, I'm interested in the grazing methods used and how vegetation composition changed. And if you can talk to yesterday, Molly, JB had a question about patch burn graze. And I know you mentioned in this video that you do use patch burn graze, but it's uh, a little bit different than we might think of in a very traditional way. So if you can touch on that in your answer, that would be wonderful. Yeah. So I mentioned in the video that the patch burn grazing um, they're doing what we want. They go to the patch once we burn it, but originally our herd size was too small and our patches were too big. Um, and now, so we as soon as we decided to decrease those, of course, we had a drought, so we weren't able to burn. Um, and now we found rusty patch bumblebee at Miniopa. Um, for those of you who know that uh, changes the time of year you can burn and puts some restrictions around that. So we're planning on burning um, just 10% of the range this coming year. Um, we'll probably do it in the late spring and then hope to see them move on to that patch. And I also mentioned the exclosures, which is another way just to keep them out of some of their favorite areas. And so this past year, they're really hitting a nice sedge meadow um, pretty hard. And there's a little bit of reed canary grass in there and they don't care for the reed canary grass so i didn't want to, them to convert it you know into reed canary by eating all the sedge so we just put an exclosure around that this year we'll put that exclosure in a new area and just kind of um, another area that they're maybe getting a little too hard in we want the sedges to recover so we'll just move it to another little wet sedge meadow that we put the exclosure in so that's mostly how we're um, doing it, but like the big grazing areas that they like that are cool season um, exotics, we don't care how hard they hit those. So they, you know, they regularly go in those areas. Yep. Um, so that one, uh, number three, uh, that one is kind of a previously farmed, um, only partially restored old field. So, um, you know, they can be in there all they want and I don't care. Um, but like the number two is where that sedge meadow is that we excluded this past year. So just trying to make sure they don't hit some of the nicer. Yep, there's the picture of the sedge meadow. Um, and it's a really quite nice with um, forbs and things in there. But uh, parsnip came in. Um, into that sedge meadow. So we've been working hard to get control of the parsnip as well. So um, yeah, we are not moving them, the bison themselves. We're just kind of trying to change where they want to eat by um, manipulating uh, the things that we can, which are the exclosures and the burning. This work. Um... I'm going to shift us to <laughs> this one, <laughs> uh, which is, uh, you know, a, a loaded one. But maybe I'll have you all speak from your different perspectives about your individual time, you know, that you spend on this project. Maybe that's a better way to answer this than trying to summarize everybody's time all at once. Uh, and actually, we're going to start with you for this one. Do, whoever asked this question, do you want to give voice to it? just so we can hear somebody, you know, other than us. Hi, yep, that was me, Emily Hutchins. I asked the question, just we have cattle grazing up here in the Northwest, and so it, it takes a fair amount of our time every year coordinating, coordinating with the producers and um, implementing our grazing system. So I'm just curious about bison and how, how it might relate Um, I don't have actions. a great, yeah, I don't have a great percentage to just throw out there and, and say um, off the top of my head, but the reality is, is they're pretty self-sustainable. We don't spend a lot of time managing them. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm and the time that we spent moving fence and moving cattle, because we did a lot of grazing, 
was significantly more than we're spending with the bison. Um, we do weekly fence checks, especially during the summer months. Those take a few hours and that'll vary depending upon the size of your range. Um, but other than that, in the summer, it's just a daily check to monitor them for health and the time that we spend opening and closing the range. It's been pretty hands off. Um, we talked about once a year, we have our management event. That does take um, the better part of the day to run everybody through during the management event. So there's one big day where, you know, you're completely dedicated to the bison. Now with that said, you know, we spend the month before and it's not consistent time um, just because we have other things to do, but we need to prep that facility to handle the bison when they come in. So it kind of varies throughout the year. Um, when we talk about the winter months, we're still doing those fence checks, um, just making sure that everything's looking good. And then we do supplemental feeding of hay, um, but really that they wouldn't necessarily need that. We're doing that more to just keep them happy. They would shovel through the snow um, to find more forage and that is sized accurately for the number of animals we have. So it's significantly less work, in my opinion, than cattle. Craig, how about you? I know you spent uh, maybe a lot of hours fretting, but I don't know if that counts as official work time or not. <laughs> You're just no, worried about this. No, I don't believe I got paid for that time. <laughs> um, but uh, there was a lot of hours initially when the bison first arrived and responding to, to new challenges in the public. But as far as right now, Ashley, um, Ashley nailed it. I agree with what she said. How much time in the beginning do you think? I mean, everybody's talked about this was a long process. I think Scott says in the video, don't don't think about getting bison and then expect that you're getting bison <laughs> like the next day. How I mean, give us just like an idea of the planning amount of time that went into that, even if it's just an estimate. Oh, wow. So that was many meetings over multiple years. Um, a lot of those, though, were because um, trying to narrow down a location for the bison. There was, I think, Afton, Myrie Big Island, Camden, and Miniopa were the candidates in Minnesota for bison, and it eventually was narrowed down to Miniopa. So there was a lot of planning there. And then um, I wasn't involved in the fence planning, but I I was heavily involved in the planning of the corral. And that was a significant amount of time in terms of visiting other sites and locations, uh, reading, watching, trying to understand them, um, understanding their movements at blue mounds. There was, there was a ton of time that went into that. And I, I could go on and on about um, what we should have done differently for that whole process in terms of, um, in terms of a corral system because there's a there's a lot of good ma companies manufacturers out there that provide pre-made stuff for the bison and it can be shaped it's it's a, it's kind of like modular office systems um, they connect via pins and you can make just about whatever you want out of it um, so we made some mistakes there but we we ended up with a good product um, and then after they were actually on the landscape then it was it was just nonstop reaction to the latest, not bison issue, but people issues. That that electric fence at the front that Ashley mentioned was a reactionary. The um, trying to prevent the calves from escaping was reactionary. Um, the number of signs, different signs that we tried throughout the range on the hiking trails was reactionary. Um, the people teach you something new just about every day that you may or may not need to respond to. Might be an isolated incident, maybe not though, and it's a trend. So um, there was a lot of time there, and there there will continue to be a lot of time, or not a lot of time, but time put into that. But in terms of at this point, I would say what Ashley said is is pretty accurate. It wasn't fast enough. What I was trying to do is show that picture from the video of everybody, um, of all of the people standing right there at the cattle guard, you know, and there's people popped up 
out of sunroofs and there's people congregating next to that cattle guard. And, you know, it's always something as I'm watching that that I'm thinking, yeah, I know that they're not making it across that cattle guard, but the fence is just right next door. <laughs> like I would not be standing that close to an animal that large. So I'm sure there's a, a lot of time that went into the design and the fence. Molly, can you talk a little bit about that aspect of it? Because I know, and, and particularly the cultural resources aspect that I don't think we've touched on yet other than in the video. Yeah, the fence was a challenge because um, we do have, you know, 18 inches of soil before you hit bedrock at Miniopa. Um, so it's a very hard place to put a fence in. And then on top of that, we had this huge cultural um, site that was there and needed to be protected. So we actually had archaeologists following behind the pole, the fence pole digger and, and sifting through um, to make sure, you know, see if there were any artifacts that were being found in each, you know, hole. So that was, you know, kind of above and beyond what a normal um, fence installation would include. And um, and a lot of them had to be drilled and even cemented into the the rock in places. So um, we had wanted a fence that was wildlife friendly. And so we had done a lot of research. There was a, a, a publication out of Alberta for bison fencing that was wildlife friendly. And in my background, I was in Wyoming and I lived, my house was right on the biggest mule deer and um, pronghorn migration route in the U.S. and they would get stuck in the fences. So that was kind of my background was seeing all these poor animals stuck in the fences. And so we knew we didn't want that to happen with our white-tailed deer. So, you know, I had these areas where the top wire was pulled down so the deer could jump over and we GPSed the crossings where the deer were crossing before we put the fence in so we knew where those areas were. And then those darn white-tailed deer didn't get the memo and they would just, big bucks would put their antlers through the high tensile and just go through the middle of it and not jump over our our little pull down. So, you know, some things we thought we were doing really great would work for the fencing didn't, but um, overall it turned out fine. Um, I'd say because we're the state and we have to bid out the way we do, and we had an engineer assigned to the fence design. Um, we probably have one of the most expensive fences that, you know, a private person could have done it much cheaper, I guess is what I was trying to say. Um, so sometimes when people see the cost, it, you know, there's like, wow, that's an expensive fence. And it's like, well, most people don't use an engineer uh, to design a fence either. So. Um, so a little bit of the process that we had to go through was painful, but overall we finally, you know, got where we needed to be, so. Yeah, I just think it's striking in that one photo, all of the flags, um, which just yep. goes to show you, I mean, every, so every flag is marking an artifact or um, a significant cultural resource. It just, I mean, just look, it's just yep. lettered with flags. So I always think that's just a really striking photo where, you know, it's just, it's just neat, basically. Um, Gwen, from a partnership perspective, how much time, how much of your time do you feel like you spent, you know, planning for the project and uh, engaging now? So like a two part, like in the planning phase and now in the, the bison are here phase. Wow, that's a that's a good question. Um, it was it was really meaningful that we were involved very early on, um, and so that we could talk about the cultural significance of the bison to Dakota people and the significance of this place, the the land around Miniopa and Blue Earth County. Um, along the, the Minnesota River as uh, traditional homelands for Dakota people. So we had really good partners at Miniopa um, who, who listened um, 
and uh, ask questions. And I think that was a really important part of establishing that relationship with us as <clears throat> the kind of like, I don't want to say liaison, but um, the, the initial uh, partners in helping to ensure that um, the, the cultural significance of these um, uh, bison um, was fully understood by the entire team. And so when we said we wanted to sing for them, when they came, nobody questioned it because they understood. When we said we wanted to feed everybody who helped take care of them, there was no question because everyone understood the relationship that we have culturally with um, our relatives. I don't even like to call them animals, <laughs> but our relatives. So that was that started very early, and um, and I think it's been a really good, open, communicative relationship that resulted in, in a very successful reintroduction of those bison to this place. I think if I could sum that up in three words, I would say listening, learning, and not being afraid to ask questions. Absolutely. Sure you're all, on the, all on the same page. That's beautiful, actually. I'm really proud of this team. Way to go. You do a nice job. Um, and that partnership continues, the Bison Drive, for folks who haven't been on it, um, there is a, you can tune in to a radio station and you can hear and learn more about the Bison and you can hear Gwen's husband, Glenn, on there sharing his wisdom and knowledge about Bison, um, about how they are, um, the Dakota relative, and it's just, it's really interesting. They switch it up every now and again, so it's not the same thing all the time. We've noticed that there's different voices that emerge and it's just nice. It's a, it's a really nice add to the Bison Drive where you get to learn a little more. All right, Karen, would you like to ask this question right here? I should have given you a heads up that I was going to call yeah. on you. Sorry, I had to find my mute. <laughs> it's, I know, um, I, that's why I should have said, Karen, I'm about to ask you a question. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm just interested in the vaccination, what you're vaccinating for, and how that fits in with managing uh, bison as wildlife. Who wants and, to start? I'm not sure who to send this one to. I can start Karen, with I that one. Okay, Karen, did I cut you off? I want to make sure I didn't. No. Okay, you're. Okay. Okay. All right. So. One of the things that we're vaccinating for is pink eye. And for those of you that aren't familiar with pink eye, um, it can cause blindness without being treated. And since they are managed as more of a wild herd, it's very difficult to capture them and, and do those treatments. It's also very difficult to identify from afar in the early stages. Um, so by vaccinating for it, it helps prevent pink eye. Um, pink eye it can be transferred from animal to animal by flies. So it is something that could very easily affect the herd widespread. The other thing that we are vaccinating for is mycoplasma bovis. So it is just a very common disease in any, it, it's typically in bovine herds, but it can also affect the bison. So it's just something that we want to make sure that they aren't getting because it can be very debil debilitating for them. In addition to those two vaccines that we're giving them, we are doing a sampling, checking for internal parasites. Now, the really cool thing about grazing is you generally have a reduced parasite load. Now, with chronic treatment of internal parasites, you can get resistance. So there's a level of acceptance. And we work with the Minnesota Zoo and their veterinary care team. They serve as our vets here at Miniopa. And they help us identify if it's an acceptable parasite load or if it's something that we need to look at treating. Um, since the herd came, we have never had to treat them for internal parasites. Everything has always been very acceptable. So um, by letting them graze and move around, it really helps to control that parasite load. The other thing 
um, that they're doing is they're going to do a fecal test. And again, they're just testing to make sure that we don't have any mycoplasma bovis in there um, and things like that. Um, they'll also check for yonis, which is another disease that's very commonly found in bovine um, that could also affect bison. Now, they are tested for that prior to being introduced, but it's something that they want to make sure isn't getting into our herd. Um, beyond that, it's just any like wound care. So if they, you know, would be, you know, scraped up a little bit um, while going through the corral system, we would provide wound care at that time to try to minimize any effects on them. And really it's our goal to get them released as soon as possible. We don't hold them very long um, in that squeeze when we're working on them. The other thing that I should mention that we do is we do um, give them, it's an RFID tag. So it's an ear tag, but it allows us to identify the animal as an individual. And we really don't use those on a day-to-day -day basis. It's only to track care and, you know, if we're going to move that animal to be able to identify them as an individual. So yes, they are being managed as a wild herd, but we still have that obligation for that individual identification and care. And some of that does reflect that we are a USDA certified facility. So we are mandated by the USDA to provide a certain level of care and to have daily monitoring of those animals. Karen, did that answer your question? Do you have any follow-up questions after hearing that? Um, I, well, I guess I was just, uh, we, we have bison where I work, so we don't vaccinate them at all. And uh, we have, I was under the understanding that the mycoplasma bovis vaccine is not known to be effective on bison. I mean, it hasn't been tested enough to know. Um, so that's just something where we, we, what we do is just monitor um, and do necropsies if any animals die and, um, you know, that kind of thing. So I was just curious. <laughs> no, it's good to be curious. But um, I, I could flip this and I have a bunch of questions, but I will, <laughs> we won't do that to you, Karen. <laughs> Megan, My I just wanted to maybe specify what Ashley said about us being a USDA um, certified facility. And that is because they determined that the animals were on exhibit. Um, so it's almost like they're treating us a little bit like a zoo because of the bison drive. And then at Blue Mounds, we sell tickets for people to go out onto the range in a bison um, vehicle. Uh, so that's why, you know, most places that are going to get a herd are not going to be um, a USDA facility and wouldn't have to go through those steps. So I don't want to freak people out. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to specify why we fall under that extra level of review is because of that exhibit uh, type thing. So, Molly, do you know if some of the Thanks. national parks are considered the same? Um, and I, I know this is outside, but I'm just curious. Yeah, I don't like, think they are. It had to do with are you charging money for, um, you know, for the for people to see the animals, and it wasn't just the park pass; it was uh, selling the tickets for going on to the prairie tour vehicle and that kind of thing. So, you know, and the Minnesota Zoo is obviously also under that. With they sell tickets for people to come see animals. So, I see. Yep, and it has to do with the exchange then, because even even though we're not selling tickets at Mediopa, we exchange some of those bison with Blue Mounds, and then with the zoo and. The yeah. whole herd together, but at multiple sites. That makes sense. Thanks for that. We're gonna and thank you, Karen. We're gonna pivot to Becky. Would you like to ask this question about oak savanna? Sure. So I think I remember hearing about oak savanna, um, pockets of oak savanna, the habitat being being present on Miniopa. So I'm just curious in case I missed it. Do the bison have access to those oak savanna areas within the park? And if so, have you seen any changes in like vegetation structure, the way the bison behave in the oak savanna versus the open prairies? 
Uh, they do have access to Oak Savanna. Um, we have Oak Savanna on each side of the fence, um, uh, both within the range and outside. And I would say our Oak Savannas were um, heavily invaded with buckthorn um, and other woodies, you know, just overgrown like a lot of Oak Savannas are. And so the bison themselves have not done um, anything to really change that composition. Uh, we have brought in CCM crews with brush saws and that area right there is after the CCM crew that Megan's just showing. Um, and then increasing our fire and especially the growing season fires. And we just did burn this area a year ago and had a nice fire running through that buckthorn area. So I would say it's more our management. Um, the bison don't spend a lot of time in there. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen the bison in the Oak Savannah areas. Maybe Ashley or Craig could mention it, but they don't spend a lot of time in those more um, enclosed areas. And that might be a predation thing where they like to be able to see the predators coming at them, but. Craig, Ashley, or Scott. Actually, Scott, I'm going to ask you if you've ever seen them in that um, Oak Savannah, because I know you're often, or excuse me, you were often out on site giving um, educational um, trainings and talks. And so I'm just curious how you observe their movement. Um, the only thing that I really noticed is um, they do have paths through those Oak Savannas, but like Molly says, and Craig alluded to yesterday, they really do prefer no matter what time of the year to be out on that open prairie. That's really where um, you see them most often. So I think if they're using those oak savannas, it's just a way from moving from one place to another. When, how about you? Where, where do you see the bison when you're out there? They, we've seen them in practically every um, portion on the on the map here. Um, so when I, I I wouldn't know if they had been in the in the trees or not. Um, so I've only ever seen them walking through and they just look like shadows. It's always amazing to me how such a large animal can blend in so well with, with its landscape like they can be sitting in that little blue stem you cannot see mm -hmm. them and it's just baffling to me mm -hmm. that was All really right. interesting thank you um let's ask becky we're just going to go ahead and ask your second question here about um the rusty patch bumblebee and I'm gonna have you ask it, but just to give folks uh, an idea, this this adorable little bee is uh, a federally listed species. And so that comes with it some, how should we put this Molly, some challenges and opportunities with our management. And so we'll just talk a little bit about that, that balance as well. Becky, you can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so that was really exciting but I know the challenges that come along with a, a listed species, um, you know, on land that, that we're managing. Um, so you talked to the burn restrictions, but I may have missed it again. Are there any graze restrictions that you have in place? Do you do exclosures to an area at a certain time? And then are there any other um, rare species found on there where you have to balance that need for maintaining healthy management of healthy habitats along with the balance of the healthy species populations. Sure. Um, finding the rusty patch uh, was exciting, but then kind of a like, oh crap moment because <laughs> suddenly your burn windows just changed quite a bit. And um, especially burning, um, you know, the queens are in the wood woodland or wood edge areas and and our goals out there are to burn and to run that fire into those woods and push those wood edges back so if if that's where the queens are and we don't know that for a fact but um then that kind of restricts our management all of a sudden so um we literally found the rusty patch like late last summer and so the map 
So if you go onto the Rusty Patch map and you won't see many OPA included yet, but um, so it, it, we kind of don't know exactly what our restrictions are gonna be. Um, the DNR last year for Parks and Trails did it on a project by project basis um, and got that approved through the US Fish and Wildlife. So um, we will be, you know, probably more careful about burning into that wood line. Um, for a grazing perspective, um, I don't see anything changing there. I know with some of the goat grazing, there were concerns um, in some rusty patch areas because the the goats were really heavily impacting some south facing hills that rusty patches were using. But um, my understanding is grazing at this point should be fine. Um, we also don't know if they're in the bison range. Um, so next year we'll be really looking for more rusty patch and try to figure out kind of what parts of the park they're using and um, and seeing what how that will affect our management. So, but we were doing a lot of um, summer burns too in these prairie areas. So that, you know, that makes us also rethink, do we want to be burning up those floral resources at that time and things like that? So it, it does throw a wrench in things. Have to get creative with your management. Well, it's always a challenge when you have 18 million acres of prairie that we used to have in Minnesota, and now we have about 250,000 remnant. And then, of course, Miniopa is a, a mix of remnant and rest, restored prairie or actively being restored prairie. So that is always a challenge to try to figure out how you're going to fit all of those prairie pieces into a greatly reduced landscape. So I appreciate you all working on those puzzles because it's not it's not easy. Megan, I forgot to answer the last half of that question about other rare species. Um, oh, yep, that's where it. We did kind of an, an entire environmental review ahead of time before we brought bison in, and that was part of the decision making is because we knew they're going to benefit some species, but not others. So um, we kind of did an analysis of all the rare species we knew we had, and if we thought the bison would, you know, benefit or not benefit them. And like one example is we used to have upland sandpipers out there but it's not open enough anymore and we don't. So kind of my goal and my, like my little goal in my head is, man, if we got upland sandpipers back, you know, that, and then we're, we're working, our grazing is working. So, um, but you know, you kind of have to choose which species are you're okay with benefiting or not benefiting and, and go with it. This leads right into our question from Troy and Gwen, I'm going to put you on the spot again from a from a visitor perspective to see what you have noticed since the bison have come back. But I'm going to let Troy ask this this question first. Troy. Yeah, Molly, had a good lead in with it, but um, just stepping back from, you know, we talked a little bit yesterday and then earlier today about some of the wallows and you kind of mentioned some waterfall use and stuff, but um, yeah, I was just curious, any positive or negative inter interactions <coughs> that uh, you've noticed or been surveying with other wildlife species, badgers coming back through, jackrabbits, deer interactions, wild turkey, everything like that since the bison would come and, back. Well, I, that's a wonderful question, by the way, Troy. Gwen, we're going to start with you from a visitor perspective, because I know you visit Miniopa quite frequently, just what, you, what you've noticed, and then we'll pivot to Molly. Molly. You know, we're always so focused on the bison that we don't look for anything else. <laughs> There's a whole prairie out there. I know. I know. <laughs> but that's the best answer you could get. <laughs> You're like, I don't know. I just look at the bison. <laughs> well, you know, and we 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 have, you know, individuals that we always look for. And we count the calves and we watch their interactions and the, the wildlife are the visitors. Um, and we, we watch them a lot too to see what kind of crazy things they try to do. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I, that's my goal this year. I'm going to pay more attention to who else is out there with, with the bison. <laughs> 
you know, and this is maybe true for all of us because I notice, um, and Molly, I'm just giving you time to rest your voice here. So I, I notice when we do our native plant community trainings uh, that the DNR hosts in partnership with lots of amazing plant folks. Um, we're so focused on the plants that sometimes like a bird will call in the distance or something and a participant will say, well, what's that bird? And everybody's like, are you looking at the goldenrod in front of us? You know, we're, we're so focused on that plant that we forget that there's this whole community that's that's happening and interacting right under our very noses. So it's a good challenge for all of us to start paying attention to all the pieces. Molly, go ahead and. Um, yeah, so Put I'm a bird here. nerd at heart, so I'm usually like distracted the other way, Megan, looking off. In the, the <laughs> what was that calling? But um, I'll just share a story that one of the most interesting things I think is um, fairly recently after we got the bison, people noticed a cattle egret sitting with the bison and we hadn't seen one out there at the park necessarily before. And we got I was going to try to find the picture. This is a great picture of it sitting on the back of a bison lying down. And um, and then the next year, I don't know if it was the same individual, but it seemed like the same time of year when they're moving through another one showed up. So now, you know, it's kind of become this regular thing that the cattle egrets as they're flying through um, kind of visit the bison now. And so that's cool. And I definitely think um, I wish we had better bird data. Uh, we it's just we just did not have the capacity to do a full bird study. I would have liked to have really gotten a handle on what was out there before the bison and then seeing how that changed. I do think um, especially with brown headed cowbirds, there's some interesting stuff there that we probably could have seen. I'm seeing more brown headed cowbirds, but I don't necessarily think maybe there are more out there. I think they're just now easier to see because I mean, I always saw brown headed cowbirds before the bison were out there, but now they're hanging out with the bison. So they're doing what they do, right? Sitting on the backs of the bison. So are they easier to detect now or are they actually increasing in numbers? That would be like a great research question for a grad student, you know? So I wish we had a little bit better data on that, but um, there are some interesting like interactions with some of the different heron species and stuff that will eat like the placenta and stuff of the bison when they give birth out there that park staff have noticed that um, I never really understood, you know, that birds would interact with bison like that. So um, there's just some kind of cool stuff around that, but we really don't have any like good data on it. So. Scott Kadelka, do you have any comments you want to add? Uh, no, no. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to pause here for now because it's time to take our 15 minute break. And I am a firm believer in 15 minute breaks. Because I think they're just better to give you a little extra time to do what you need to do. So when we come back, uh, we will come back at 10.05 and Becky will type that into the chat. We'll watch our last module and we'll just continue on with questions. And if you feel free, if you still had questions, um, you can see them on the screen here that we still haven't asked. We can still move through those questions as well. You're not limited to just asking questions about what you hear in the last video. So we'll just keep on keeping on here. So everybody can turn their cameras off, get a little 15 minute break, and we'll see you right back here at 10.05.